Right, well, welcome. This is actually the 30th session, 3-0, 30th session of Black History Lunchtime Conversations. And I'm really grateful to everybody who's um, been involved from the very beginning, Simon and um, David, um, through to all those of you who've joined us and uh, people who are in the process of, of joining in now from all over the world. Uh, it's been the most fascinating time. So we're, we're halfway through now then the, the third season of Black History Lunchtime Conversations. Now we've got various exciting things to, uh, to do, but we'll just do a little catch up um, with uh, one or two of our, our visitors from, over, from uh, far afield. I can't say overseas myself because I'm in Australia. Um, where it's winter time and in Melbourne and the weather's not too good. So anyway, um, <laughs> Professor Sati, it's good to see you in Joss, Nigeria. How are things there? Um, the weather is fairly good today. Um, we have not been having rains, but the rains are back, so we're sleeping nice. Um, things are fairly good now. The weather is pleasant. <laughs> Well, that's really fabulous. Okay, and now we'll say hello to uh, Dr. Bunny from um, uh, near Toronto in Canada. Hi, Bunny, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning. to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad yeah. you can join us. Thank and uh, Bunny is um, very active on a daily basis. She's putting out information about black history on the Sankova Pan-African series. So we'll maybe have a catch up with you a little bit later on, Bunmi, to find out what your latest episodes have been about. I've been trying to keep up to date with them. Um, it's been Thank fascinating, you. especially seeing David Alston featuring in one of the sessions. I so know, a <laughs> very fun session. I had, I had fun interviewing him. I really enjoyed the interview. And my audience seems to, a lot of them, you know, love the interview. They're amazed about the connection between Scotland and um, Libra. They love them, they know too. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. And it's really good because through the Black History Lunchtime Conversations, we've been able to link quite a lot of people and, and to, to link um, research into various stories and, and find out about new ways of telling, telling stories. Yeah. Yeah. So that's brilliant. But we're just going to make a start because um, Jean Samuel, um, who has uh, established um, international talent outreach. Jean Samuel, if you recall, those of you who were here way back last October when we started in the UK's Black History Month. Um, Jean Samuel from Bangor, um, well, I say currently, but, but prior to that from the Cameroon, um, is an amazing artist and he was our artist in residence for Black History Month and we loved seeing your your paintings <laughs> each session. Thank, thank you, thank you very much Liz. It was so good but now we're fascinated because you've got international talent outreach going and you've been to Nigeria recently so I'm yes. amazed by that. And yeah. Simon's got some pictures, he may be able to show those, I'm not sure about that. But uh, tell us about you, about the project and, and what was important about this trip and how you got on. Okay, um, I will start by thanking uh, everyone present and uh, for continuing, even uh, in my absence. I'm happy to be back and then to share what I've been doing around the world, especially in Africa, concerning talent uh, development. Like I informed uh, us sometimes uh, at the beginning of the year or at the end of last year that we had an international talent development initiative called International Talent Outreach, which operates in Cameroon, South Sudan and Nigeria. But for some reason, we have decided that the headquarters will be in Nigeria, in a place called uh, Naja State, the capital is called Mina. And uh, I might be able to tell the reason sometime. So. I've been wanting to go there to see how things are happening to meet the children that are beneficiaries, the board of directors and uh, the country directors and to see first class or first hand what is happening. But because of the coronavirus and the travel restrictions, 
it was difficult for me. Nevertheless, uh, early April, with the help of some sponsors from the United States, I was able to go to Nigeria this time and to really have an extraordinary outreach. The good thing about the whole visit is that I was able to feel first class the passion that the whole community in MENA has for the talent, international talent outreach. They really see that this uh, organization will be able to give a, motivation, a motivating spirit to their children, especially to their girl child. I was worried at the beginning because since it was a Muslim community that they may not embrace it, especially if their female children have to be part of this talent development initiative. But to my greatest surprise, I realized that there are even more young girls who, are, who want to become painters. Some of them are craft women, and some of them are doing embroidery. Others are doing um, like dressmaking, fashion designers. So it was an extraordinary outreach. I had many workshops with the children. We painted together. They were painting competitions. And uh, I think I was received by about 15 local chiefs, local chiefs. I don't know the equivalent of local chief in the UK, but those are like uh, community heads. And they joined together, to, they have given us, donated from the, hello? Are you getting me? Maggie, can you switch the phone? I can hear her fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. I can hear you now, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, we, I made the whole community, the community leaders and the children, and uh, all of them are participating and donating in their own way. Because at, now we are at the beginning stage. They do not have, they have no funding at all for now, but they are donating their time. Some are contributing money. And the chiefs have done something very great because they have given us many hectares of land where we can eventually build a center and a playground and um, develop it for the benefit of these young artists, not only in Nigeria, but also in Africa. Because we intend that this talent outreach should be like a vehicle or an outlet whereby the African child would be able to express himself to the world visually by what they can do. It's a way to fight poverty as an artist and to help children to be socially inclusive. I present myself to them as a mother because I come from the same paralyzing circumstances like them. But I have understood that every human being can get better without the ideal situations. So when I explain to them how I was once like them, having the same problem that an artist have, especially an art African artist, but now I'm where I am. I've been able to travel to more than 20 countries in the world, exhibited my, my paintings in more than 40 countries in the world all because I was a bit stubborn in my passion for being an artist. And I just believed in what was considered by many people to, imp to be impossible. Even the whole talent outreach uh, initiative was born out of a great dream because it, it, at the beginning it was just a vision and a dream that I decided to put it into action. But at the moment now, a lot of people are sympathizing with it and looking for ways to make it uh, happen for the best advantage of the children in particular. So maybe Simon would be able to show us some of the pictures that I can explain. Like you can see me here with the children and uh, where I consider myself now to be a Welsh. Anyway, I've been Welsh adopted and I really feel at home. That is why the Welsh flag is always, be, you can see the Welsh dragon behind. So things are part of the community. This picture was taken after I had a workshop with the children and we now showed to the audience what we were drawing together. All right. This is one of the local chiefs, uh, the guy who has actually donated much of the land for us to develop for the benefit of the international talent outreach. Well, one, one, this girl is, is, uh, is she's the youngest uh, sculptor of the organization. She was showing me what she has made with Claire. And uh, yeah, she was showing me her work. 
Well, this was yeah, random pictures when I was addressing the crowd and motivating the children and telling them my story and helping them to get better than me someday, just to believe that they can do the impossible. In the, yeah, drawing with the children, one of our workshops. We, we also have elderly artists. Some of them are builders. This guy, as you can see, he's doing um, these blocks with clay. And some of them are doing ornaments and so on. So these mm -hmm. are people that are involved in the organization. And that, those are some of their works. Good. Fabulous. Yeah. You can see the other children with their own activities. Then a lot of traditional dances, traditional rulers that graced the whole occasion. It was a wonderful occasion. Well attended. Brilliant. Yeah, this, this young girl was a very special girl. She is a small artist, but now she's sick. She has a problem with her heart. So they are worried if she would be able to live again. But she had a lot of energy and enthusiasm. And uh, she even asked to bless me. So I decided to take the blessing by kneeling down. So we should, she's someone we should think, we should think of. Because I heard that her situation can be helped, but they need so much money to, to do it that the family cannot do it. So when, when I was leaving, she told me that when you go, remember me. So I'm sharing her story to us now. Maybe somebody's heart can be touched. She can live again if something happens. Otherwise, she's still a very special girl. I was surprised when she opted to give me some blessings. And I just knelt down in front of her because we never know. All right, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John Samuel. Yes. It's really inspirational, the work that you're doing. Just fabulous. Um, not only are you an amazing artist in your own right with your own particular style, and I'm sure you'll be coming back to share some of those, some of your artwork. Um, yeah. But I wonder if anybody's got any questions. Uh, we've got Professor Sati from uh, from Joss, which is quite a way, isn't it, from where you were? Yeah, yeah thank you, Liz. Uh, I have a May I and speak? Maggie, just turn yours off a minute. Thank you. Okay. Right. Okay. Please, Professor Sati. Okay, thank you very much. And I thank um, the presenter for this uh, wonderful work he's doing. He's like uh, helping Nigerians and helping Africans in general. And this is quite impressive. This is the second time I'm listening to his presentation and I did comment it. Um, it's, it's interesting that he considered the, um, what we call traditional rulers in, in Nigeria. Uh, local researchers call them gatekeepers. By gatekeepers, we mean to succeed with any research or work or project in any community. We need uh, their permission, their prior permission and consent. And so to have worked with these people, um, his project will really, uh, the sky will be the limit. And so thank, long thank as you, doctor. Thank you. With them, um, he will have no problems at all because there's so much respect for traditional institutions in the different communities in Nigeria. Anywhere you go, and if you sideline them, even if you are, even if it's Bill Gates uh, Foundation and they are not uh, put into consideration, the project may fail. So I'm just, just, just to appreciate the fact that you know these local details and that you are able to uh, work with those people. And then to thank you again, most profusely for choosing Niger State, for choosing Nigeria. Uh, as you well know, uh, in, in, in the recent uh, few weeks, Niger State has been on the national and perhaps international limelight yeah. for the attacks on those communities, particularly those in the villages. In fact, uh, my in-law, who is an evangelist, uh, his wife had to be, and her children 
had to be sleeping somewhere in the bush to escape the bandits. Uh, but now I think some relative calm has returned and I think uh, work can go on again. Uh, here in Nigeria, we are people of enormous hope and we always hope that tomorrow is better. So with your project, our project of hope will um, see the light of day. Thanks for the encouragement and God bless. Yeah, uh, let me comment there. Thank you very much, uh, doctor. Uh, as you say, I cannot know everything. But before mm -hmm. I went, I met somebody from the locality who advised me about the importance of those local chiefs. I would mm -hmm. have made a mistake maybe not to remember to involve them. But I actually mm -hmm. saw that their mm -hmm. presence catalyzed, made everything to go on very smoothly. And the, the fact that they accepted me, automatically the whole community was like for me. So mm -hmm. it's a very good observation, but I will not take the credit. The credit will go to someone else called Mohammed Usman. He's a guy that uh, is my director in that level. I just have a good dream and good wishes, but I need the help of people like you, people, anybody in the world to make this dream come true. So I thank you very much for commending that activity. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Maggie, you were um, not long ago back home in Nigeria. Did, Maggie is a colleague of ours from... Um, 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 Penny Groyce, yeah. Groyce in Gwynedd, North Wales, um, and it's really lovely that you're with us. Um, Maggie is um, a chef um, and entrepreneur, and she's going to be joining us maybe next week. We're going to try doing doing a, a first. We're going to try a cookery session, aren't we, Maggie? But oh, Maggie, yeah. is there something that you wanted to add. I know you know. I think you know Jean Samuel because he's based yeah. near you. Yeah, no, I, I, because I didn't join early, I didn't know which country he was, um, he was showcasing, but I hear that it's uh, Nigeria, and I was wondering what part of Nigeria. Hello, did Hello. you hear me? Okay, yes. Um, I was in, uh, in Naja State, in a place called Mina. That is where we okay. have decided to put the headquarters of the organization, not only for Nigeria, but for Africa. Even though it was started in Cameroon, then to South Sudan and to Nigeria, for some reasons we have, we, I, I thought that since Nigeria has the greatest youthful African population in the world, I mean, I saw that to be a great labor force and good resources. And I thought that if I should target the Nigerian young man, then the whole Africa would benefit from that. So I prefer to look at life many years after now. And uh, we, that is why we are based in Mina State, so in Naja State, in Mina. Thank you. That's really good. Um, recently, um, well, not recently, about three, four years ago, I spoke with uh, someone, and this is just a by the way to what you're doing. And there was a project going on in Niger State with um, soy, soy beans, and um, um, soy, soya itself. In um, is it soy? Yeah, they were making soaps and they were making cosmetics. But it was women who were going into the village to get uh, these soy beans so they could. Uh, uh, they could convert them to cosmetics and sell them abroad so they could send their children to school. That, that yeah. was in Niger State. So it, oh. it, uh, as you were talking, I thought it would be lovely to, you know, sometime visit wherever the area is. But the fact that there's a project going on there as well makes it doubly interesting. Thank you very much, Maggie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Now, Jean Samuel. Oh, Martin, do you want to comment? Yes, I just want to say something here briefly. Uh, I'm based in London, and as you can see, I'm a sort of white, uh, white British sort of person. But I do work uh, with Nigerians and other Africans. I've been to 15 African countries. I speak French, uh, which is also useful for part of Cameroon that uh, still speaks uh, some French. And I have Cameroon contacts uh, also. Uh, the, uh, we're linked with an artistic cultural organization called Iroko Theatre Company, who the chief executive joined one of Liz's uh, lunchtime conversations a couple of weeks ago. But he's a self-employed entrepreneur, so he's working furiously to try and keep his family alive uh, in the problems of COVID. Uh, Iroko is a tree in Nigeria that Africans will know about, and he uses it uh -huh. as a symbol 
for his organization as a, the tree of learning. So I'm happy to work with uh, Sam, John Sam, Samuel or Maggie or anybody uh, in making international links uh, culturally through our contacts in London. Thank you. Wow, uh, you're welcome. Looking forward. Yeah. Yeah. Like you say, the Iroko, the Iroko tree is very symbolic. When an important person dies, they say an Iroko tree has fallen. Yes. Right. Well, très bien, Martin. Um, merci beaucoup. It's about my limits in French, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> now, Jean Samuel, um, there's a comment here from a suggestion or a query from Simon. Is there any kind of fundraiser for the young lady or could something be organized, a crowdfunder, or even some sales of art, the art they do with the profits going to her? Hopefully this could encourage support from the UK as well as Nigeria. And certainly that's a possibility. Um, I know you're just coming through your quarantine time and um, uh, you know, getting your feet back on the ground here. Um, so uh, yeah, Simon says, let's, let's talk some more about that idea. Yes, at the moment, there is no funding. I just came with the news. And the, yeah. the intention for putting it into this forum was because I was hoping that we can, uh, that somebody, I mean, we can have the empathy to see if there will be a way to help this young girl. Anything we can, anything can do, anything can do. I think selling their art to help her or trying to help her in another way, I think the organization will be open and her family will be open to any sort of help to help her so, so survive. Mm -hmm. So some kind of crowdfunder. Again. So um, yeah, we, I can talk to you more about that, John Samuel. But we can see, see about setting up some kind of crowdfunder and sharing it in our networks, and hopefully we can get you know a few people to make some donations. Okay. Yeah. That would All be right. Brilliant. Well, um, what you've been talking about is is just fantastic, and it's been so interesting that during the time that we've been. Um, carrying on with our Black History lunchtime conversations, you've been carrying on developing um, uh, this, this wonderful initiative. Um, and also in Bangor, um, uh, in the next, I'm not sure if it's happened or it's in the next few days, there's going to be the opening of an African Caribbean community centre. So that'll be a, a wonderful asset. And it could be a focal point. And if uh, we could, could work with Salama too and, and colleagues, that might be even more helpful for you. Um, but um, all the very well, best through the rest of your quarantine time. And, uh, and I'm just going to show you something now from Nigeria. Now, this is pretty elderly because um, <laughs> I was in Nigeria in 1960. Okay. But this beautiful, beautiful um, carving is wow. actually... Uh, calabash and as you can see it's i can see that yeah yeah I can see that. So i've kept treasured that all these years and even though i'm here in australia and here's the other one i've got with the most from, from oil from oil the most Ooh. remarkable craft work um and i was delighted to hear that um there are young women in your project who are also interested in crafts so there are a great yes. many skills and craft talents. Um, one of the sessions that we had um, while you were over there was about the Benin bronzes. And it was wonderful to see the quality of the work that was, was going on there. It was absolutely fantastic. Good, so yeah. uh, thanks ever so much. That's brilliant. OK, uh, then. So um, okay. well, Sati, please, can, I, can I just say can something? I OK, please. And then Sati. OK. Hello, Liz. Yeah? Yeah, so sorry, I love what you showed the um, sculpture and that's going back a long way. I brought this back this year. Um, and this is, but what, you're, what you showed us looks like really good quality. Um, so yeah, these are just um, food vessels. That's a spoon type thing. Um, Professor Satio, no, we for for dishing up kunu or something like that, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, just in comparison to yours, yours look very detailed. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, they must be hard wearing. They've lasted all this time. Professor Sati. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just to go back to um, the suggestions for helping this young girl. Um, 
uh, I think um, your your colleague in Nigeria, your Nigerian director, can uh, start some kind of um, movement for saving this girl. If he has credibility, if he has integrity, he can put up um, some call for assistance, give an account number, give the girl's details. And if people trust him, uh, they can drop some money there. Uh, because the problem is uh, trust deficit. People have to trust you before they, they raise money for you. But the, 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 the issue of this girl is very important. I think you can advise him to start something. If people in the community respect him, if people in Niger State respect him, they can raise something regardless of how small or big it may be. That would All be right. my suggestion. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk with him today. And also there is one commissioner of uh, investment that uh, he said he will be very, he was a former commissioner of health, now he's commissioner of investment. So I talked with him a bit about the girl. He said he would like to get involved in seeing how the girl can be helped. So I'll talk with two of them today. So then we can, they can build um, a satisfactory forum where we can now pass to help this uh, girl. It would be a wonderful thing if the only project that this organization would do would be to leave, make this girl leave again. I was very touched. I was very touched. And I could see she was so special because she did not give up. She had not given up. She is happy to bless someone leaving and happy. So, yeah, thank you for your proposal, sir. Uh, Prof, thank you. Thank you, that sounds, that sounds excellent. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure that, that, that you'll have success if you follow, follow this up. All right, I'm just going to ask um, Bunmi um, if she's got any comments. Bunmi's uh, Nigerian um, at the moment living in Canada, but um, have you got any any questions or no or not the, really just to say thank you for that um, for the work he's doing and uh, for the presentation right thank you very much indeed thank you bunny that's great right we have uh, um thank you very much indeed um john samuel um originally from cameroon um now welsh cameroonian um is that right to say yes yes <laughs> Highly you welcome. Take, you take that red dragon flag wherever you go. Yeah. And um, it's really good to hear about uh, your uh, organization now, um, uh, International Talent Outreach. And we look forward to seeing uh, some examples of, of the wonderful work that you're doing with those young people. It's great to see the pictures. Thanks yeah. very much. You might see if we can do another presentation with all those pictures. They were great. Thank so you. I've got a couple of other guests to welcome. Um, at the moment, we've got uh, Abu Bakr. It's good to see you. And Abu, I'm nice. delighted to hear about your new initiative. And we're going to be talking about that, I hope, in a little while. Okay, okay. That's brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. And also to welcome Professor Robert Moore um, from Nuren. Uh, it's good to have you with us today. And um, I'm sure you, you may have things that you want to comment on. Okay, so um, we'll just move on now because I'm going to ask Maggie if she's uh, got any further ideas about what we're going to do for the cookery session next week or the week after. Um, yes, probably the week after because next week is the bank holiday uh, oh, right. weekend, so not I ideal. And um, we, we, I was thinking of exploring um, two things really. Uh, gumbo, because uh, gumbo has its roots in um, in Africa uh, and okra and all that. So I wanted us to talk about gumbo, and I also wanted us to try out some gumbo. So what would be ideal is if I sent anybody a, everybody a recipe, and if you could uh, if you could consider making gumbo, so you can taste it while we're talking. Um, uh, that that was one of the ideas. And then um, if we have time, and if we don't, I will. Um, talk a little bit about uh, Puff Puff, um, just because it's um, uh, it's a worldwide thing, but it's very it's very African and very Nigerian, and where it's been perhaps crossed the borders, what uh, different things have been uh, done to our traditional Puff Puff. But um, if you all can't make it, I will make some and I will taste them for you all. It's just what I I want you to be aware of. So um, that that's that's the thinking. Um, um, and yes, um, if anybody has any ideas on gumbo other than the ones I bring, I, I will look forward to having chats around that. Yep. 
is still on the phone. Gombo sounds delight. I haven't had it since the last time I was in Africa, I think. So. Thank you. It's it's it seems very common in the um, in the Americas, you know, um, New Orleans and those mm -hmm. parts of um, and and many people think of it as a uh, as a, an American dish, but it's got its origins deeply in African roots. So we're going to look at that and mm -hmm. perhaps explore a little its travel. Okay, well, we'll look forward yeah. to that very much indeed, Maggie. And yeah, Sati? Quick question. Sati? Yeah, quick question. A question to Maggie? Yeah. Yeah, um, This is it gombo you talk about? Yes, Prof. Yeah. Um, generally, when 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 in, in in Europe or outside Africa, when you talk of Africa, it's it's very difficult to understand. But if you say it has Nigerian root, Cameroonian root, because this colonial division has <laughs> like given us some kind of identity that um, we want to be a little bit specific. Uh, so when you talk about it uh, next time, uh, can you take it down to where it actually came from in Africa? Prof, I will actually do that. I just I oh, okay. used Africa as a as a general term to just get us um, thinking, but it, 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 I will definitely try and get it to its origins or the places that it does actually come from. Yeah, I, this was just a, a general overview. And like you, I don't like um, us being uh, being referred to as Africa because we are particular. Uh, yeah, particular parts of Africa. And Prof, just so you know, I'm from um, I'm from Nigeria myself. So oh, uh, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. All right. That's really Thank great. You. Okay, so um, I'm just responding here. We've got, we've got various messages coming up. Okay then, so um, thank you very much, Maggie. We look forward to that. I've just managed to get hold of Hillary and she is going to join us, but I generously said to her to join us a little later because it's very early, <laughs> early in the morning in Jamaica. So she'll be joining us in a little while. But before that, um, we've got uh, Levi Lawrence with us. And uh, Levi is here in, uh, in Australia, in Victoria. And uh, we met up quite by chance. And, um, and I, I said to, to Levi, um, where do you come from? And he said, <laughs> Birmingham. So we had a good conversation in black country language. <laughs> Um, so, Le Levi, it's brilliant that you're here. You joined us on Thanks. a previous occasion. Yeah. And what, when I began to tell Levi what my interests were, Levi said something that absolutely stunned me. And Levi <laughs> said, Oh, my dad was on the Windrush. <laughs> oh, wow. So it's just wow. Well, uh... <laughs> yeah. So, Levi. Levi, your dad um, also uh, was interviewed by the BBC, and you have these two yeah. recordings now. Yeah, that's um, right, yeah. Not being very efficient, I haven't actually decided on which clip we're going to listen to. But remind yeah. me, is, is your dad Daniel? Yes, so my father's Daniel, yeah. Daniel Lloyd Lawrence, yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, Daniel lived in... Um, Birmingham with your mom. Your mom's yeah, still, right, yeah. still in Birmingham, um, yeah, and your brother's in uh, near New Newtown in in Wales. So uh, yeah. that's, that's another link that we've got. So um, yeah. Levi, do you want to to tell us anything more about this this story, or, or shall we just see what clip we've got, and we'll just maybe have five minutes clip of your your dad's interview. Yeah, you can do. Maybe play the clip and then I can sort of comment, yeah? So I'd just like to say, yes, yeah, so my, um, my father passed away in um, 2003. And um, so I was given a copy of um, the tape or, or the interview with the BBC um, when he came out to visit me, uh, which is the one and only time. So he came out in 2000. Um, and, and that's when he actually gave me a copy of the tape. So... And I must confess that up until then, um, I wasn't familiar with the Windrush story at all. Uh, I don't remember him um, speaking about the Windrush at all. Uh, I mean, you know, we heard lots of stories about Jamaica and, you know, as a youngster, I spent some time out there, but um, he never really spoke about the Windrush. So so when he gave me a copy of the tape, sort of explaining the whole story of how he arrived in the UK, 
um yeah that was all kind of new to me and that was back in 2000 and uh 2000 and, sorry that was yeah that was back in 2000 yeah that's right yeah so he came out in 2000 spent a couple of months here with us um i left the uk back in 89 and so that was his first trip out and um yeah that's what he he left me with so yeah which is it's it's, it's just a, it's just a great it's just a great interview it, it really is so yeah <clears throat> if you want to play uh, we'll listen to to some of this now yeah uh, um Right, would you like to introduce yourself? No, I can hold it. Oh, you know. yeah. My name is Dan Lawrence, and I was born in Jamaica, in the parish of St. James, near Montego Bay. And what year? In, in the year 1922. So now I'm 76. Tell me why you decided to come to England. Well, I would say it was um, a challenge to the spirit of youth and also it's an opportunity to see the country that I learned so much about at school. Um, my coming was not really for so much for economical reasons because um, I didn't know what prospects there were here then for a job. But um, I was a rather idealistic uh, sort of person. And I think England fitted very much into my idealistic outlook and life. And I wanted to see the country that um, influenced my education very greatly and my values in life. Can you explain that a bit more? What sort of values? Well, I would say um, the value of site for some kind of technical hitch. Well, if we aren't able to, to, to get this playing um, this time, um, Levi, I think you said it's okay if we, we actually put this on one of our yeah. websites so that people can listen. Yeah. It's, a very, it's a long interview, isn't it? Oh, here we go. Yeah, I think I've got it back. Let's for English and um, English men. And uh, they played a leading part in molding our educational outlook. My textbooks were all um, English textbooks. And uh, so I developed that love for things that were British then. Of course, we, we never had any other way in which we could identify but the British way. But that was the way that we grew up. The dates. What what period are we talking about? We're talking about the period of the oh, early 1930s. <laughs> early 1930s. Uh, yes, I would say all through the 1930s, late 1920s, and all through the 1930s. Yeah. Um, English education to me was very attractive because um, I read a lot about um, you know the outstanding um, personalities in um, English and um, English literature um, in different aspects of um, British life. Actually, that was what influenced us most in all the schools. We were influenced by the British way of thinking, the British outlook. And, uh, British values in general. So what were you thinking when you decided to come to this country? Now, when I decided to come to this country, I thought it was an opportunity to see this side of life here and to see how well it compared to what I thought about it. And at the same time, to take whatever opportunities were here that would enable me to um, achieve some of my early ambitions. Tell me now about how you came over, what boat you came on, everything that happened. No, I would call myself a pioneer because I came over with the first um, exodus of 
Caribbean people to this country. I came over on the Windrush and uh, there were many others who came with me. The Windrush was um, a troop ship and uh, it went to the West Indies with um, servicemen from here and it took back servicemen who had gone back, gone, who had served their time there and some who had gone back there on their um, leave from England who had served there. And so we uh, travelled on that boat together with quite a number of other um, people from other islands. But I think Jamaicans were the majority of immigrant people on that boat. What was it like, the journey? Well, the journey was very interesting. It took, um, it took us about two months to get here. We had a number of stops on the way. We, the first stop was in Mexico, and then we went on to Cuba. We stopped in Cuba. And we came off and we had a look around in Havana, Cuba. And we found that yeah, that, that um, city was very interesting at the time. It's not like it is now under Castro. It's a very interesting city. And then we went from Cuba to Bermuda. And we found Bermuda a very interesting um, group of islands. We spent a little time there. And then we left from Bermuda and we came on to England. When we came to England we, we landed at um, Tilbury um, Docks in London and it was a very cold um, day. It was in June but un, you know unfortunately it was not a summer's day. It was rather cold, rather chilly and my first impression was how do people manage to live in this country at this time of the year, you know, being so cold? Well, unfortunately, that was a cold um, time of the year. It, that year, we didn't have a good summer in England. It was very, very um, cold that year. And many of the English people that I spoke to at the time, you know, they, they themselves were very... Um, uncomfortable about the sort of weather that we were having at the time. It was not the usual weather that they expected to have. Well anyway, I made the most of it. I Well, I had to face the challenge then. I'm in a new country. Conditions are not what they were in my country. So I've got to settle down as quickly as I could and made um, the best of it. And that was what I did. I faced the challenges. Um, the first winter I spent here was very interesting because I saw snow for the first time. That was very exciting. And, um, but of course, um, there were other difficulties that we were up against at the time. Housing was very difficult to come by, and we had to make the most of what we could get at the time. Not the best, not what we had hoped we would have um, found, but what we did get, we had to make the most of it because we had to live somewhere anyway. It was not the best, but it um, we made of it. Who is we? Well, all the immigrant um, uh, people who came off at the time. Incidentally, I would say that there were mainly men who came. There were perhaps very few women who came on that trip. Were most of us men, young men, most of us were at the time. There were a few older men who had worked in England during the war, they went back home to Jamaica and they couldn't settle down there, so they came back on the boat with us. But most of us were young men who just came over um, on a wave of excitement to see, uh, to, to, you know, to, have, to try life out in a, a new country. Yeah. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. We just just hold on to that. Oh, Levi, thank you so, yeah. <laughs> so much uh, for you know sharing this originally with me and and now to be sharing it with us all. Um, yeah. It is quite remarkable. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking um, 
When I first came to Australia, I, I set out from the UK on a big trip with a friend and I was 26. And that was the same age my, uh, my father left uh, Jamaica for the UK. And um, my youngest son is 26 and he's leaving Australia. He's, got, he's off to live in New Zealand on the weekend. So <laughs> something about that age. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, wow. it, it's yeah, it's a great interview. Yeah, it really is remarkable. One of the things I I found incredible is how perceptive your your father was. He's he really yeah. gets into the interview. As I say, the interview is uh, about forty five minutes. That's just one, yeah. I think. Um, yeah. So he yeah. really, you know, reflects and talks and reasons and. I thought yeah. it was lovely the way he said, you know, it was an opportunity to see see Britain and to uh, see if it was like he imagined it. So he already yeah. had yeah. an idea that it might not be quite like yeah. her. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. Yeah. yeah, really, really lovely. Okay, so is there anything else that we're, we're expecting Hillary? She'll join us. And one of the things that... Um, I don't think in the interview your father talked about um, and many other people haven't spoken about, but I've been talking to John recently and John's got his hand up to ask a question. So or make a point yeah. I'll talk to you, John next um, is the, the people who are left behind. And that's what Hillary is going to be talking about. So um, and that's a, a real issue. And also, you know, issues about the reception of of people in this country. Yeah. Over to you, John. Yeah. Okay, I'm speaking from Birmingham. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I, I just that I picked up some things in that um, talk because um, you mentioned there were elder people on there who've been to the UK or been to yeah. Europe um, mm -hmm. during the war and they were coming back. Now, I mean, I've, I've read one or two stories um, and met somebody actually uh, who was an airman um, and he wrote a book about his experience. It's called Jamaica Airman. And, um, but uh, I mean, the, the people found that after they, first of all, when they've been here, they found difficulty in getting back to Jamaica or the Caribbean in the first place. And secondly, you know, there wasn't much, um, there wasn't much, really um, to say there wasn't much appreciation of the work that uh, they've been doing and the fighting that they've done uh, in the war and so on. So that that's something that um, I just wondered what uh, your father's experience was in, the, well, the other people who were, were on the wind rush was in that respect. Yeah, I, I think um, my understanding is that um, a lot of those older men who had served in the armed forces during the war, um, they went back to Jamaica and I guess um, after the war, there wasn't a lot of work available. So they decided to go back to the UK. And, um, but I don't think they were welcomed back. I think that while the war was on, I think they were welcomed. And once the war was over, there was almost the expectation that they would actually go back and not remain. That's my, uh, my understanding. Of the experiences of those you know who had served during the war and had actually returned back to the uk um i, I guess further on in the tape my father talks about the reception when he arrived in the uk and he talks about receiving a mixed reception and uh, i think what he what he says in the tape is that some people were sort of curious about him because they'd not seen uh, black people before and um and they sort of questioned him about why he wanted to travel to the UK, such a cold place, and leave such a, <laughs> a warm place behind. And um, but I think there was this expectation too um, that you know that he too would return, return, yeah, back to the West Indies. There was, yeah. Um, but he also talks about you know um, uh, he, he met some people, some some English people in the park, and he was invited back to their home in Smethwick. And um, he talks about traveling to Smethwick. And uh, when he arrived in the area, people would just look through, look and run inside, close the doors. <laughs> and, um, and there was another experience where he was trying to ask for directions. Um, and this lady just sort of, she just, she just ran away from him. She just kept running. And, uh, but he explains all that away because what he says is that, well, look, you know, these people, 
they've not traveled, um, you know, they're not necessarily educated, so it's not really their fault. And um, it doesn't use the word uh, racism at all throughout the, the, the interview. He talks about encountering prejudice, but he doesn't use the word racism at all. But he's sort of able to sort of explain things away, you know, when he does encounter prejudice. Um, and some of it was quite serious because, um, you know, in terms of trying to go for work, trying to get a promotion at work, uh, it, trying to find housing and so on, you know, he, he did encounter a lot of prejudice. But he seems to, you know, he's able to sort of explain it away. Um, it's as if, it, you know, he's a bit above it, <laughs> but a bit above them. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, and yeah, it doesn't it doesn't sort of affect him at all in 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 that sense, you know. I mean, obviously it was difficult because you know it just made progress difficult for him, but he sort of he sort of seems to accept it. He doesn't sort of politicise it uh, in that regard. <clears throat> mm. Thanks, that's interesting. very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that, that, sorry, Dave, I was just going to yeah. say. Um, my my dad's experience was a bit different. My dad didn't come from Jamaica, but my dad came from Mauritius. Um, and my dad came in the 60s, early 60s, um, from Mauritius. And he didn't know any English. So he didn't finish school to a very high level or anything. But his first language was actually an Indian language, um, Pojpuri, and also Creole, um, Mauritian Creole. So when he came to Britain in the 1960s, he came on a, on a ship as well. And they yeah. traveled through the Suez Canal. So they came from the opposite direction up to Britain. And um, yeah, he used to tell us stories. My, my dad passed away last year. Um, but he used to tell us stories about his journey and how he came in when hearing your dad's it kind of reminded me very much of similar my dad's yeah. story which is yeah, yeah it's, it's really interesting yeah. that even almost two decades later or a decade later my you know my dad had similar experiences as your dad did so things had, had not yeah. quite yeah. changed that much you know despite thanks. having yeah. that generation but it's, it's yeah. really interesting yeah. yeah thanks for sharing it yeah yeah, it's interesting because uh, another thing my father says is that um, when he arrived in the UK, he was quite surprised that the locals didn't have any sort of understanding of the Caribbean or the West Indies, whereas he was educated in British culture and appeared to know a lot more about British culture uh, than they knew about his background. Mm -hmm. And that was something that surprised him because I think he always saw himself as British, being a part of the empire. Mm -hmm. And he actually does say mm -hmm. that was the only identity that was available at the time was this British identity. So um but it's also interesting um living in australia because a lot of australians also looked to britain in the same way you know it was the center of the empire and they also made the journey to to the uk too because it they saw that as you know as as part of their culture and, and history too so there are all these sort of colonial sort of <laughs> connections which are quite interesting yeah definitely i think my dad thought the same yeah. he, he you know he was british born british despite being born in mauritius so yeah. he always thought of himself yeah. as being a british person so when he came yeah. i think he was he was quite surprised as well but yeah. the story of how cold your father felt when he arrived my dad yeah. arrived i think in march and it was absolutely yeah. freezing and he yeah. you know it was such a shock to the system just to come yeah. arrive at victoria station he was just you yeah. know thinking to himself oh my god i'm never going to survive here it's just not gonna yeah. it's not gonna happen but he, yeah. you know, he stayed here for 60 years and it was just, yeah, <laughs> it is yeah. quite surprising, isn't it? That feeling of belonging somewhere despite yeah. never having been there before, you know. Yeah, that's right, yeah. 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 That's the power of the empire. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yes. And I think it's really interesting, uh, Seema, after our conversation, uh, uh, well, during our last conversation, I was saying that, that really um, each country has its own uh, its own history, obviously, and then its own shared colonial history. And yeah. so I think the story of um, the people from India and other um, other places, not Africa, also have got stories that are, are very relevant in this yeah. this whole context. So those are things that we're we're starting to look at. Um, Apu Baga, have you got um, anything that you wanted to add? Uh, could you hear me? 
Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I just think it's a fascinating story, you know, because for me, looking as a historian, I, I look at it from two perspectives. I've got my own particular narratives, you know, based because my grandparents were the, region, were the ones who came here first. Three of them came here in the 1950s, early 60s. And then they worked, sent for my parents who came here in the 60s, which was the same decade I was born. So I have that narrative, but it's always fascinating to hear other narratives as well, to give perspective, because what I found with, 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 with my parents, at least, it was something they never really wanted to talk about. They never really wanted to talk about their journey and, you know, the coming here. Maybe they wanted to stay back in Jamaica because obviously their parents came here. I said, well, look, you know, I mean, I'll go send for you, <laughs> you know, send the money back and then they, they came over here. Maybe they wouldn't, it, it, you know, is that now I'm missing some of those narratives from my parents' generation, even though my father passed away like three, four years ago, when he obviously he went back to Jamaica. And my mother's still living here, she's living in Nottingham. Even when I question my mother, she's just she just doesn't really want to really talk about it. <laughs> but I was glad in a sense that my grandparents told me about their journey because they felt very British. Yeah. They were, you know, they were West Indian and they were coming to England and to the mother country and all those type of things. And they were very much one of those, it was one of those experiences where they were, where they were opening up to the realities because they never really wanted to go back in a, in a sense. But it was nice listening to that clip to look at another perspective, an individual who actually came during the Windrush period, not, you know, later on in the fifties, you know, or whatever the case may be, you know, the, those earlier migra migrations you know, migrant neighbors that came here. And that initial first experience as, you know, as minority groups of the first of its kinds, you know, to, to arrive here. So for me, I, I found it really, really fascinating. And it's given me more of a historical context. What you'd get fed if you were ill. So if you were ever ill, but, uh, oh, my voice that is. <laughs> yeah, if you were ill, Oh, so I was having a conversation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I, I, I just think it's fascinating. And, you know, and as a historian, you haven't written books. I'm writing books now in order to get it out there. I think these things need to be um, solidified in notes and within literature or whatever the case may be, because I think it's important. I think it was a scary experience for all of those that came over here, you know, risking it all. Some had money, some had no money at all. You know, they're not sure what they were going to encounter, you know, really and truly. And obviously listening to what Levi was saying about the people who came over during the war period and, you know, finding hardships when they went back to the Caribbean and unemployment that increased in those areas. And that was like the thing that brought a lot of them to come over here. So it was like, it was more or less an imposition for many of them to leave the Caribbean to come over here to make a better life, you know, because one of the things which I always remember about my grandparents and parents, they would always say back home, back home, back home, back a yard. So there was, there was still that connection there, even though they were over here. But that downplaying, I think, as, as an African Caribbean born in this country, because they spoke Jamaican, they spoke, you know, Jamaican now, but we were not allowed to speak that language. Yeah, we were, we had to speak the Queen's English. And then when we were speaking and using terminology which they didn't understand, they would get offensive. Well, you think he's intelligent now. No, I don't understand, you know? And it was this case of being dislocated. We weren't allowed to speak our language and our, our culture because that's the only culture we knew. We were told we weren't Caribbean or West Indian and the dominant culture were telling us we weren't Welsh, English or British. So there was a sense of dislocation, hanging and trying to find an identity. You know, so we have our own particular narrative as, as Windrush, Windrush children born in the UK. And I think these narratives would be nice, you know, to come together to look at that intergenerational change and that particularities in the way that people journey, you know, physical journeys or the emotional or psychological journeys and, and bring that into the narrative. But that's all I wanted to say. It was really nice, Levi, listening to that tape and you know, your father, you know, your father, you know, mentioning particular things that I've I haven't come across and things that I may have overlooked as a as a researcher, as a historian. But that's why I'd like to say thank you very much. Yeah, I was just going to say I can make the full 
trans the tape available too. So um, I'll get Liz to put it up. So if you want to listen to the full full tape, you might find that yeah. useful too. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. We'll we'll do that, Levi. We've got a website yeah. and we can uh, direct people to that. Bun me. Have you got a comment you wanted to make? Bun me. Yeah, just first to say thank you to Levi for sharing that um, recording. And then um, also I've been trying to look for a series I watched, um, I think about a year ago. Um, it's not, not an, a new series, but I think it was done by um, the BBC or another TV station. And, and I'm uh, trying to find a name to recommend it for uh, Abubakar, who is uh, doing research on, um, uh, on the on the different generations of um, uh, black people living in the UK. And what they did was, I don't know if anybody else has seen, I haven't been able to find the title. What they did was to get people from now, I mean, from current times to live the kind of lives, families from the current time to live the kind of lives, the kind of ways that um, the first generation lived in the, in the first decade they started arriving in the UK, um, the second decade and so on. It was a fascinating way of doing history. You know, they actually got them houses, you know, um, to share like most people who arrived there, um, uh, who first arrived there from the Caribbean had to share um, with all the inconvenience, you know, they, um, and they made them dress and use utilities and utensils, you know, that those ones use. And it, it was, I, I have never seen history better presented, you know, in, in a way that a lot of people can access. I was going to recommend that to you, Abubakar. If I do find the name, I'll, I'll find the, the name of the series, I'll find a way of getting that across to you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thanks for that. Okay, I've just got Hillary on the phone. So any other queries or anything else you want to add, Levi? No, no, that's fine, thanks. <laughs> I have to leave soon, actually. So. Okay then, right. Um, yeah. Well, just to say that uh, I'm hoping Hillary's going to be all right joining us. Are you okay, Hillary? Okay. Well, if, if it doesn't work this week, then let's let's um, carry on next week. All right. Yeah. OK. OK. Hang on one moment. I'm going to put you on loudspeaker so everybody can hear. This is Hillary from. Are you there, Hillary? Yeah, Hillary's from, from Jamaica. She says she's having problem with her connectivity uh, today. So I'm suggesting she joins us next week. But you were saying you think that there'll be very little recognition in Jamaica about the de departure of Windrush. Yes, there will be yeah. very little. And um, there is little acknowledgement. However, uh, what has happened is that we see from the British side that the most poor generations I think actually, Hillary, there, there is some interesting work going on now over here about um, sometimes called the barrel children, the children who are left behind. Um, yes, yes. And um, I know John uh, Tyrrell's passed on some information for me about things that his colleagues have been looking at. And also, um, there's another interesting, um, I think it's been on the TV this week, a program called Subnormal. And this was a scandalous um, uh, thing that happened was that many um, of the children who were coming over, um, their parents were Windrush generation and they were 
were coming over from Jamaica and they were being put into what we now in the UK call special schools and treated as if they were they had learning difficulties and that's an extremely um, distressing um, scenario so we're going to be following that that one up too so Hilary we'll talk to you next week all right and, and, and before I go I want oh, yeah. to remind you of some work that Bernard called of Grenada did more than 40 years ago in which mind just sending me those details and i'll share them with people sure. and we can we can check sure. that out sure I will. Sure I will. all right thank okay. you so much hillary thank you thank you bye bye, bye. <laughs> it's the second time we've done a, a three-way conversation the time in australia hillary's in uh, in jamaica and um uh uh, you're all around the rest of the world. Right, okay, we've got several things in chat at the moment. Um, it was good to see Robert Moore, who wasn't able to stay for too long, but I'm sure he'll be joining us again. Um, Apu Baga um, said uh, to let Maggie know that he worked in a restaurant called the All o Old Orleans in Cardiff, Wales in the 80s and 90s. And the majority of what they called Cajun cooking was from West Africa in what they called the French Quarter. It was during this time that he got into American, African-American history as a professional chef, and then he left to become a historian. So um, he can't wait for this cooking session. I think it's going to be great fun. That's really, really super. So, and um, uh, Ange also said that she's very much looking forward to the learning about uh, about gumbo and uh, and thanking Asima and Levi for their their contributions really useful now David Alston do you want to uh, speak uh, come in on this one David yeah I, I, um, I was really fascinated by what Levi was saying about it, the his father's sense of Britishness and I've just said, just been reading the, the Marxist historian C.L.R. James's book called Beyond the Boundary. He, he's better known for his Black Jacobins, um, which, which I think Abu Bakr might have mentioned when, um, in one in, before. <laughs> um, uh, but Beyond the Boundaries, about about his, a lot of that is about his the the importance in, in his formation of his his British education in Trinidad, and the values of cricket. And the way in which that really that really formed him, and I, and I was also thinking about Jeff Palmer talking about how cricket had been such an important part of of, of his life when when he when he came to, to London. Um, but but uh, the, that that's about his experience of being in England. I mean, he came and, and worked as a professional cricket player. The the cricket league clubs used to employ one professional. And, and he, he worked as a cricketing professional and as a journalist for the, the Guardian and later the Glasgow Herald. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's just it, it, it's it's fascinating about being being in Britain as a black person in the twenties and thirties, with that se that same sense of 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 Brit not just a sense of Britishness but a but 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 a real valuing of that. And there's, there's a fascinating moment in the book where he talks about attending. A meeting being addressed by an Iron Bevan. And Bevan was very, I mean, he's such a powerful public speaker, and he was very effectively mocking the English public school system. And the whole crowd were, were responding to it. And CLR James said he 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 felt he was almost the only person in the room who couldn't join in because. In, in this very strange way, it was the values of the English public school system and its sporting traditions which had formed him. And, and he somehow, he, he just, he couldn't join with Bevan in, in the mocking of it. He made a very interesting comment. He said he thought there was one other person in the room who couldn't join in either. And that was Michael Foote. <laughs> it's a complicated world. <laughs> it is complex. Thank you very much indeed for that, David. That was great. Um, Levi's had to leave us now, but I think one the one comment that I was going to, to make, um, and Apple 
a bagger. I think you'll um, you'll maybe understand this one. In that he was being interviewed um, in uh, get his name right. Uh, Mr. Lawrence was being interviewed in the 1980s. Now this was before a time really when there was much discussion about this. So it it wasn't as if he was like people nowadays are talking about Windrush is an assumption that other people know about it and that other people, are, you know, almost people are representing um, a whole um, generation of people. But it's the, um, there's, there's just something about the tapes that's fascinating. It's just so real. And he's obviously a very bright person and his reflections on the situation that he came into And his understanding also of the people who he was meeting in, in Britain was fascinating because, you know, at that stage, um, people was, when he first came over, people would still be very much traumatised by the experience of the Second World War. So that's, uh, that's fascinating. So thank you. That's been a, a really great conversation around that. And we're going to continue um, looking at the, the, the Windrush story. As I say, Hillary will join us next week and we'll pick up some of the threads of, of other people. John, I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, we've got um, a, a professor from Ireland, um, long time since I've been trying to get a contact in Ireland, Professor Lucy Bland. I'm not sure if she's in Ireland, but she's also got some slightly different stories that uh, I've not heard of before and that is that the uh, the children who are born um, as a result of Second World War relationships and in particular in Ireland and I've been in touch with an organization called the Mixed Museum in uh, Northern Ireland and um, well I don't uh, I'm not quite sure I thought it was in Northern Ireland anyway they um, They've got some really interesting stories. So, John, you wanted to add something. And then we'll do the PowerPoint, Simon. OK. John? John? I can't hear you, John. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to update, because this morning's mirror, um, just 633 Windrush victims get compensation as claims take five times longer to process. So there's still a big issue here that it's taking so long. And maybe there are people out there who've not yet made claims. And I think, you know, if we're able to um, make that clear when we're um, getting in touch with people, making that, 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 um, that this, is, this is available if they, if they don't know about it. But uh, it still shows that the situation isn't good and that, um, you know, it doesn't seem as if they're taking the, the, the time and trouble that they should be in getting this sorted. The other thing is that last night was that the um, Educationally Subnormal Program, a British, very British scandal, was on television. And I got um, about 18 pages off, well, um, quite a lot of pages off the BBC site on this and it's got to what's happened to one young one man who was um, put into an ESN school and how it blighted his life and it's got a bit about Bernard Cord on it, in it as well. Gus John uh, was interviewed within it uh, mm. so it's, it's it's on iPlayer if, you, if people want to see it and um, I say there's quite a, a thing that you can print off from the BBC, uh, from, from the website. Okay, John, well, I, I'm not sure if you'd sent me those links or not, but uh, that yeah. certainly is, is very interesting. And Gus John, Professor Gus John has, has promised that he will, will join us at some stage. Um, and he sent me the, the link to that because he knew that I was concerned. So um, Simon, uh, right, we're just going to have a look at a PowerPoint of, things that came through this week. Now, this is one of the things that I want to really ask advice about, and that is that there is so much going on in the world of black history in countries all around the world, but there are, there's and, and many events, and how how is it best to share these? So um, with our new website that we're setting up, which is called um, Unlocking Black History, um, uh, that's our working title. And um, we're going to also be looking through that at, at how we're sharing stories. So 
Um, okay, Simon, we'll just move past this. That's lovely. Okay, so one of the things that, that's coming up, so this is an update really on, on what's just come through this last week. So this is the um, Amina Gathor Institute. Um, for the study of indentureship and its legacies. Now, as you know, um, Jim Thakordin has been talking to us about um, the importance of understanding um, indent indentureship. And Seema, I think you, I know on your website, you've, you've done some something about this and, and understand the importance of, of, of sharing that story. So that's Sunday, uh, next one then. Okay, so this is, um, is it the same, the same one? I can't remember. Anyway, this is, um, yes, I think it's the same event, isn't it? No, it is. No, no that's not, it's not the same event. That's, that's, that's a different one, Liz. Diana speaks. Put it back. I've got copies here, right. Okay, so um, this one is on Sunday at, um, um, 8.30 in the evening, and then on one, Simon. And this one is at 2 p.m. So you can certainly get a, a whole lot of information. And it's good to see um, Jim's daughter, Jane, is also going to be um, on the Guyana Speaks, um, along with Dudley Charles. So that'll be uh, an interesting session as well. So these are all um, possibilities. So if the weather's really bad in the UK or wherever you are, there's plenty of things to watch. Or hopefully if they post them, then we can watch them afterwards. Thank you, Simon. Right, well, it's next Tuesday will be the anniversary um, of George Floyd's death. Um, and there are a whole lot of activities. One of the ones that I've chosen is from the University of Wolverhampton's Equality and Diversity um, uh, group and, and Black History um, in uh, Wolverhampton. They've got quite a, an active group. So um, if you want you know, details of any of these links, then just let me know or you can Google it yourself. Thank you, Simon. All right, this is another one. This is Welsh African Creatives looking at emerging futures and an exhibition launch. Again, that's next Tuesday, a recognition event. Um, so that's a, a Welsh example. Thank you. Um, we've got um, a really, really interesting initiative here. Thank you, Apu Baga. Um, Rooted Alternative Native. A supplementary Saturday school this delivering education to children 8 to 16 in the history of black and brown people in the prehistoric era when they left Africa to populate the rest of the world right up to the modern era. Thank you, Simon. So this is some more information about Rooted. I don't know if you want to say anything about it, um, Apabaga. Yes, um, I was approached by um, two women, Donna Ali and Terea Cordell, uh, both from Wales. And uh, this was after my television interview with ITV, looking at um, the, contra the, 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 the controversy around uh, Thomas Picton's uh, images, both in the museum and the taking down of the statue in, uh, I think it was City Hall, yeah, in City Hall. And they contacted me. And one of the things was, was that one of them, like uh, Saria Cordell, as an example, she had a lot of problems with her daughter. She's from a mixed race background. Both her parents are mixed race. Obviously her daughter is slightly darker, living in uh, the Vale of Glamorgan in Barry. And she had gone through horrific treatment of, 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 of racial injustice, basically, within the educational system. So um, they contacted me and they wanted me to maybe put on a program because of my specialism or expertise in black and African history and trying to put it more towards the youth. So, um, you know, that's how, how it basically came about. They were very impressed with some of the stuff which I've done. I am trying to get this out to, because most of my focus over the last maybe 20, 25 years has focused mainly on adult learning, but I'm trying to go more into youth learning now because I was very um, instrumental 
in the program. Uh, me and Liz were part of an organization that she set up a few years ago, looking at you know teachers and trying to integrate black history in the curriculum. If you could remember Liz, and we went to the Senate to discuss it, et cetera. So, you know, there's been a lot of movement, you know, for curricular change within Wales. And obviously on the 19th of March of this year, you know, Kirsty Williams, she accepted all 51 recommendations from the working group, which now mean, which maintains that black history, Asian history and minority ethnic histories will become compulsory in every single subject. This is what's important here, not just in humanities, every subject. So, um, this was just basically to feed in to give parents some sort of access, looking at the black and the African uh, experience and for children to learn a little bit more about the people that they live amongst from a historical perspective by taking them out to this 500, room, 500 year room of enslavement and colonization and maybe look at some of the contributions the achievements and accomplishments that their ancestors or people who they live amongst have contributed toward history and culture. So this is just a short program. It's an online course. It's only going to run for a few weeks. It's only going to be a month as a pilot. If we get a lot of international students, etc., it'll carry on to be online. But what we're looking to do after that is to, to provide a venue, maybe in the Grangetown or the Butown area of Cardiff, to continue it. But if we do get international um, students, whatever the case may be, where we are, I am looking to continue it online. But it's mainly to ground youth in the understanding of the other, looking at the positive aspects, you know, teaching them things like, you know, the element of genetics and race, how people migrated, looking at different forms of genetic mutations, as an example, and how P uh, looking at intermarriage, looking at elements of culture, and how those things diffused into what has happened over time. So that's basically it. It's just trying to just ground children or pupils in something which they would be very interested in because they're probably more switched on about diversity as opposed to the teachers or maybe many elders or their parents within their society. So that's basically it. Like I said, it's a four week session. Um, it's basically the second week is gonna start tomorrow or the second session is gonna start tomorrow. Last week I looked at prehistory and I brought in, you know, look at mitochondrial DNA, white chromosomal DNA, look at the different migrations and how different people emerged, et cetera, in different places. We looked at the basics of culture and looking at the prerequisites that formulate culture. And we also looked at the ways in which people interacted in prehistoric times and tried to emphasize the Venuses which have been found because there's been, as many of you would know, if you look at prehistory, and especially in places like Africa, Asia, and Europe, what you'll notice is you've got all these little female figurines, which meant, which means that there must have been some sort of conviviality between male and female at that particular time, because you see more males painted on walls, but as figurines are concerned, we see a lot of females, so there must have been some sort of positive relationship between the genders or the sexes at that time. And I felt this was important to bring out because things have changed over the last few thousand years. So tomorrow's session, we're going to look at more to do with ancient history. We're going to look at ancient history, so from prehistory to ancient history. So we're going to look at different empires and civilizations. We're going to focus on Mahenjo-Daro and Harappan civilization, which is Vidyan civilization in what we know known as Pakistan region and the Punjab region, which is long before Indo-Europeans came into those areas. We're going to just touch upon Sumeria and we're going to touch upon ancient Egypt and ancient Nubia. And this is what we're going to look at and look at the type of technological advancement that people did, you know, from these particular societies or cultures. So that's just uh, the whole thing in a nutshell. Thank you very much for that, Liz. Well, thank you for sharing it with me, Apa Baga and uh, Baka, and uh, we'll... They'll certainly tell people what's going on and I'm sure there's more things. Um, so just quickly to go through, um, Seema was going to tell us a little bit about this Flintshire history heritage and the links to the slave trade project that the North Wales Regional Equality Council um, or network have, have done. It's an excellent website, flintshireandtheslavetrade.org. You can maybe look that up yourself, but there's a lot of wider information to setting the stories of Flintshire into context, and that's very interesting. Thank you, Simon. 
All right, okay, as uh, we've said, uh, the departure of Windrush, the anniversary um, is Sunday. Um, so on to the next one, Simon. And this is the point that John's just made, that um, only 633 Windrush victims, the mirror says, get compensation for claims and it's taking five times longer to process. And as Hillary said, 21 people have died while waiting compensation. This is a scandal on top of a scandal. It's just layered. Um, so it's uh, a comment there, the bungled compensation scheme. I think bungled's a polite word. Right, on to the next one, Simon. Right, okay, I've added this in because uh, in the world of book bargains, I discovered this for a pound or £2.95 on uh, Able Books. I don't think that, I think it's A-B-L-E Books, which doesn't look right to me. Anyway, it's Britain's Slave Trade, both um, Trevor Phillips uh, um, uh, introducing work by Simon Martin. So uh, again, the Channel 4 book. The, documentaries that have been on over the years like Bunmi said there have been some amazing documentaries but they're often very difficult to to find but sometimes there's a book that's uh, gone along with them so that's a resource for people okay next one Simon yep. thank you okay th this was just a little bit about the mixed museum which i found quite fascinating so if you google mixed museum you'll come across these things and looking at the um uh, mixed race irish families in britain as well as um the uh, r racial mix in ireland now um reading the letter that i've had back from the Mix Museum. It's giving a London address, but I actually thought, because the people who set it up were in Northern Ireland, so maybe I'm not quite sure. Just flash through the next two, will you, Simon? So there's a lot of information on the site that you can look up. Um, yes, um, this is Stand Up To Racism. They've got an online rally tomorrow, Saturday at five o'clock. So again, you can Google that. And on to, I think it's the last one then. Oh no, last but one. John also sent me this, which is um, about uh, African cinema and colonial history. Um, so there's some interesting information there. So if you want to know more about that, then uh, we can let you have that information. John sent it to me. And I, I'm also on the, if you go on to the next one, Simon, I'm on the Ligali, um, mailing list and they've got um, a gathering um, on the 23rd of May uh, that Sunday again uh, uh, this one's at half past seven. Um, Ligali has been quite quiet of late uh, uh, the guy explains in, in the uh, the post that I got but now they're looking to uh, to get lively again so thank you very much Simon. Right, so a quick whis whistle stop through, probably about two thirds of the information that I had this week to share. So um, what we're thinking of doing is something like a blog on the, um, on the new website so that, that news items like this can, can go on and um, information about other resources like Applebackers can, can also link on with there and organizations that we're working with like Jean Samuel's organization we can also keep keep people updated on, on the through the website as well so I was very grateful to um, I think we had Ange and um, Caroline um, Leslie and um, um, and I can't remember, we had quite a crowd um, at the last one. Bunmi came to the week before. So we're all sort of chipping in ideas and working out how we can build this website. So we've got uh, lots of ideas of activities for the next few weeks. Um, we have a professor from Sweden who's um, got uh, responsibilities for the Swedish Caribbean um, uh, links. Um, that's his area of history. We have another colleague in um, Leeds who's got uh, links 
and has been doing research on that story of the African Institute and following up what Christine Wright talked about a couple of weeks ago um, and a whole list of other folks. Uh, Professor Charlotte Williams will be getting back to Wales shortly. She's been here in Australia and when she's back in Wales next month, then she's going to do a session for us um, about the Welsh plans um, for um, embedding the teaching of black history into the curriculum. So gosh, that was a whole lot of things then this time. So thanks ever so much, everybody. <laughs> it's been great to be with you again and uh, we'll catch up again uh, next week. But uh, we'll switch the recording off now. Thank you. <laughs>